Wastelanders, Vault Dwellers, welcome back. This is the Fallout Lorecast. I am your host, Tom or Robots, and I'm here as usual with my wonderful co-host, Laney. How are you doing, Neos Pandora? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good. Doing wonderful because we have a very special episode today. We have a very special guest, somebody who you might recognize or you, you may not know by name, but if I were to tell you that this person was a world and lighting artist for Fallout 3, a lead artist and senior world lighting artist for Fallout 3 The Pit, a co-lead designer, lead artist, and senior world lighting artist for Fallout 3 Point Lookout, a senior world and lighting artist for Skyrim, a senior world and lighting artist, and the second artist on the project for Fallout 4, and also the lead artist and senior world and lighting artist for Fallout 76 and also did a lot of con contribution in similar ways to Starfield and his name is Nate Perkypile then that might perk your ears up Nate welcome to the show yeah, thanks for having me that list got pretty long after 14 years I guess makes me feel old <laughs> yeah holy moly dude thank you for joining us um, we've been talking about the creepiest things that you can find in a fallout game and you know it it only makes sense to go to the source because based on this resume I have a feeling that maybe some of the creepiest things we've been talking about with some of our guests this month might be your fault can we say that could we say it's your fault I mean I think that's pretty accurate with me wanting point like got to be horror and me pushing to have basically a bunch of cryptids in 76 yes <laughs> so we've we've figured it out so we've we've come to the source here so obviously you weren't one of part of the team for fallout one or fallout two right like you didn't you weren't one of the guys that was like yeah we should we should put ghouls in the game right that you weren't there during that period of time but you were part of the team from fallout three on you were yeah you were adding in uh, you were part of the whole modern fallout movement you've you've been working on these these modern fallout games so let's let's just dive into this because this is a wonderful thing we were talking during the pre-show about about the mood of like spooky scenes and fallout's got spooky scenes fallout's got spooky creatures where where did your let's just get into i want to get into some of the um some of your personality first but i want to get into the core <laughs> of who you are and where you draw your inspiration for these things before we get into some of the actual specifics around these fallout you know situations and creatures and things so where where does that come from for you what do you draw from I think I've always been into like horror and myths and scary stories and stuff like that you know mm -hmm. it's just always something i thought was interesting because i've always liked the creativity of it more than just, I guess, typical fiction, because you can do almost whatever you want. And it's kind of like sci-fi and why that's interesting also, because there's just more possibility space in there. Right. Do you have a um, kind of like a go-to movie or stories or books? Do you, do you, do you have like a, or, or here, let's phrase it this way. Do you have kind of a, a moment in time growing up where you came across like horror and some of the spookier stuff. Do you remember being introduced to this stuff and, and when you came across it and when it really made a difference and, 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 and struck you? Kind of I grabbed think it's hold like of that you? old book, you know, the scary stories to tell in the dark or whatever, for whatever reason they had that at our library in school. And that was one of the more messed up things I probably saw as a kid. So uh -huh. and I grew up in the middle of the woods. So I was always just imagining creatures out in the woods and I would just write stories about stuff like that all the time. Like that's where sickle man come from, came from is oh. a story I wrote in fifth grade that the teachers were not too fond of. Oh my gosh. That reminds me. So when I was in third grade, um, me and a kid that lived down the road would write stories. So we had one of our teachers was Mr. P and he was like the cool teacher. He was like the cool male teacher in our school. But we wrote these stories about him being, um, he was the cool teacher at, during the day, but he was like the psycho murderer at night. And the stories were called <laughs> Mr. P and they had like the drippy text and stuff. And yeah, we would, we did the same thing, man. That brings back memories. That's hilarious. So, so, okay. So those were the stories you read. Were there like movies that stood out? This was like fifth grade. So you were what, like nine, 10 years old. 
Yeah, but going back, I remember the very first thing that ever scared just the crap out of me. I was like, I don't know, three or something like that. And I walked into a room and Pee Wee's Big Adventure was playing. Oh my God, yes. And yes. I don't know if you remember Large Marge, uh -huh. but when her face <laughs> transforms, nodding her head. and I was so tiny and I'd never seen anything like that. Like that just stuck with me ever since, even though it's, it's Pee Wee. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but yeah. That's terrifying. Yeah, the 1980s um, practical effects. There's something that was just like uncanny about them because they. Well, they we don't like looking at things that are almost human, right? And so when you start making people and they're like, their faces are melting off like Indiana Jones style or whatever, and it seems real, but we know it's not. It, it fills, yeah, that uncanny valley kind of thing in our mm -hmm. heads. Like, it, we don't like that at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's like a, an evolution type thing where we're just so afraid of anything that's human but wrong <laughs> yeah yeah i think we're probably similar ages i remember i remember being in early high school and uh a friend got um it was like a vhs or something of uh evil dead 2 and we were, we were staying the night and he, he was like hey let's watch evil dead 2 and i was like what is that and I never saw Evil Dead 1. And I was like, do I need to see Evil Dead 1? And he's like, nah, it's basically the same movie, but we're just going to watch two. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And that's, it's so full of these practical effects, right? You know, like somebody gets their arm chopped off and it's like, all of a sudden you're in like, you know, putty land and <laughs> like, it's like putty <laughs> and like ketchup everywhere. And I just remember feeling like, oh, this is so gross. But you look, go back and watch that stuff now. And it's just like silly. But as it's like buckets of blood in that one. Yeah. But as a kid, it was just like, oh, it's so gross. Oh, it was, you know, but man, man, those those moments. So, OK, so so large Marge, you've got large Marge. You've got what was the story called? Sickle Man? No, no. The, 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 sto the, the scary stories to tell in the dark. Scary stories to tell in the dark. OK. And then as you got older, as a teenager, were there other other influences that you could draw from? I mean, then it's you get into more of the other 80s horror and stuff like get the thing and, uh -huh. you know, it's not 80s, but I eventually saw Alien. The thing is scary for sure. <laughs> I love the thing. That's like one of my favorite movies. It's good. Yeah. OK, so that's this is the setting. This is these are the influences of, of your childhood. And I feel like those are the ones that really stand you stick with you the most. Right. Now, do you have mm -hmm. when it comes to horror, sometimes sometimes, especially with creativity, you actually draw from other places as well. Do you feel like you pull influences from other things? I mean, I feel like I pull from just that feeling of being out in the middle of nowhere in the woods because it's just sort of inherently terrifying mm -hmm. uh, that sense of the unknown. It's similar reasons that people are like, scared of the ocean and stuff. Like, I mean, I was truly in the middle of nowhere where yeah. cities are not a thing where I grew up. <laughs> not real ones anyways. It's yeah. always surrounded by these woods creeping in. Right. I was talking with um, some of our patrons on one of the other podcasts that I do uh, last night about this. And, um, you know, Lainey and I live in a much more, you know, I don't know, <laughs> urban environment. And I have for most of my life, I've traveled a lot. I used to tour in a band and we've, we would go in and out of, you know, very urban and then very rural places while traveling. But most of the time when I where I've lived, it's always been very urban and in very urban environments even when you're kind of away from everything there's so much city light even just the streets and the cars and things like that it doesn't ever really get that dark on a dark night the the reflection of the lights off the clouds and things back down to earth mean that it's never really that dark it, it just doesn't it doesn't get that dark and scary but when you go to a very rural place, especially a place that's like very removed from a city out in a um, somewhere where there's a lot of woods on a dark night where this where the moon's not out, it gets very dark. And I think there are people in in the United States who have grown up in these urban environments who don't understand what that's actually like to be in a very dark place out in the woods somewhere where you can't actually see like 20 feet in front of you and where you, you hear a lot, <laughs> you can hear a lot. Right. But you turn a flashlight on and you only see where the flashlight beam goes and everything else is just black. Because yeah, there's this wall of darkness behind that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sea of black with just like, you know, just the cone 
of light like a like i don't know like an old x files where they're walking through and you just have just the cone of light you know how those they would do like that mm, um it's but, always nice and smoky yeah yeah the smoky cone of light but it, like that's kind of a kind of legitimate thing in a, in a way um but yeah that's that's a very real thing when you grow up in a place like that because that's just what the the darkness of the night can be like because it can actually get that dark or you can actually see the stars at night you know in these urban environments we don't really see stars very well um yeah, I, I can imagine that being a big draw. Um, and it's neat because in video games, we can get a little bit more of that experience that we don't get living in these urban environments. So, OK, so that's the background that you've you come from when it when it comes to that kind of thing. Now, what was the experience like working with the team at Bethesda when it came to designing some of these some of these locations was was Fallout? I mean, Fallout's always had its creepier side when you guys started working on Fallout 3. Obviously, you were taking on these motifs, right? These concepts of like dealing with the ghouls and dealing with super mutants and dealing with monsters and things. There was going to be a certain level of horror to this. You know, you've got piles of bones and, and you know, scary environments and things like that. that. That was going to be part of it. What was that like jumping into that? Well, to me, it was really appealing, especially because fallout is so big that you can take these little corners of the game and really amp that up like overall it's not a horror game necessarily but then you know like we put in the dunwich building and all mm -hmm. that and can really amp it up there more so than it is normally and right that was really fun to build that and the crazy sculpture at the bottom of that thing yeah uh, that so wasn't on the schedule i just thought it would be a cool addition <laughs> so so this is one that this came up with a few uh, actually a few of my guests over the last few weeks individually as one of the creepiest things for each of them individually and it's definitely a big big thing on mine were you specifically involved with that yeah i did like all the custom art for that wow because that was like congratulations because that was specifically noted by almost all of our guests i believe as like Per, like and um i noted to our guests that that was one of the first times because i was very new to fallout in fallout 3 that was one of the first times in exploring fallout that i really started paying attention to the environmental storytelling and um i started to go oh this game is deeper and more interesting than i assumed because there are things in this game that are alluding to other stuff beyond just the, like the main storyline they're, they're pulling from other um references other things going on in the world and those kinds of things and then that made me start paying more attention to everything else in the game so congratulations because that was that was definitely a, a like f like a formative moment in my like hey this is there's something cool going on here and then you get down to the bottom and i was like oh my god this is amazing this was that was a moment where i stopped and i went to my wife and i was like hey you need to start playing this <laughs> <laughs> I really like building all those things where it's not just like audio logs and things telling the story. Like, I mean, it, it has that aspect also, but like you said, to make the players pay attention because I like personally that experience too, of just like looking at a scene and telling a story in your head. Cause it's almost more interesting that way. Cause you don't have all the answers for why something has happened. So you might be guessing and you might be wrong. Right. But, Right. That's kind of fun. That's one of my favorite things in the whole world. Uh, I have a couple of friends that I just got into 76, finally, finally. And um, we've just been running around, you know, and finding everything that there's to find and the amount of visual storytelling, especially when it comes to alluding to other works of art and media and films and stuff. It just is so good. There's just so much of it. You find it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes you miss it, but when you when you catch certain things and then you realize uh, like, oh, this is a reference to this thing or this is a reference to something else in the game that I didn't even notice before. You know, like when you catch all of that stuff, it's, you know, it, it, it's it, it's like it rewards you for being smart, which is nice. Mm -hmm. That's always a cool <laughs> that's always a cool thing, right? Um okay, so what else what else can you tell us about that you you had a hand in? Like what are the things would we think back on and be like, "Oh, that's cool." I mean, pretty much the fall of Point Lookout and the way that is, like it was me and Joel Burgess for the leads on that. So we pitched the whole thing 
and the mood of it and i mm-hmm. got it up on the reference and the creepy locals and, the, the creepy yeah. locals oh my god <laughs> which you can probably guess the the reference of where i got that inspiration is growing up in the woods with scary <laughs> yokels <laughs> oh man yeah we well, first ran into those guys and i was like oh oh no oh no <laughs> it's just like oh <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and the the creepy uh the mansion in that with the um the old ghoul guy in there with the mm-hmm. like and he's all like fighting you off when you first get in there and then he of course becomes you know part of the main story of the the zone um yeah and i built that whole mansion which was fun since it has all those little set pieces in it too where like walls and floors blow out yeah yeah um yeah and there's a big climactic scene in there with all the like the you know everything starts attacking you and all that stuff yeah that was really cool um but just the like so living in florida the the environment here is similar to that being that you have kind of swamps and you also have like you you look at a lot of the trees and they have the moss hanging down and you've got everything looks drippy right (laughs) like a lot of the trees and things look drippy so you have kind of that thing going on but then you've also got like the you know the mood of like the the lighting and the the mist hanging over stuff skull totems and dolls in the trees too yeah so. oh yeah it's, it's just like that. everybody has those well around halloween time people decorate their houses and that you do have some of that right now if you go look at some people's yards um yeah that stuff oh that stuff's so good so let's move on to um you know after fallout 3 you you jump over to fallout 4 right so mm-hmm. with fallout 4 what kinds of what kinds of creepy stuff were you able to do with that uh i would say just like the overall lighting and stuff since i did most of the lighting Mm -hmm. on that one so i would try and make lots of creepy spaces and that there's nothing quite as obvious as like dunwich with like that's the scary place but i tried to make places like nice and moody like that right well there's the witch's museum people noted a lot about the witch's museum yeah there is that one um Mm -hmm. and yeah so i did the lighting in that one right the um and all the kits and stuff are mine too so it's made with my building kit which is like 80 percent of the buildings that you go into in the game okay yeah yeah they noted the witch's museum and that that's a nice dark interesting place with some interesting lighting um some really cool sound with the the um the death claw stomping around in there um there's the uh, when you get the, another death claw situation when you get into the what is it the raiders and they've got the death claw down in the pit isn't which one is that there's a there's a scene where you're inside a i believe it's a building i'm trying to remember wh- when this happens in the game you're inside inside a building and and down deep on the bottom floor of the building they have a death claw in a cage i believe and you can release okay, the death yeah, claw yeah. and the death claw will fight against all the raiders but then of course you're uh-huh. trapped in there too yeah is that the one that's like all smoky and stuff in there i think it might be i think it might be but that that was a cool setup as well because you kind of can sneak your way through and release the death claw but then of course everything goes to hell and now you're trapped in there with an angry death claw that's fighting against all these raiders and you're trapped in there as well and then of course (laughs) that situation gets hairy but that was i mean my strategy was always to just pump a bunch of jet (laughs) <laughs> yeah 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 see i always avoided all the drugs i always tried to go clean through it like i always tried to be like the good wastelander it's like max pain mode you know just like right. everything slows down i'm in the matrix yeah 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 man i need to, i need to do some different playthroughs i did try playing through fallout 3 once and doing only grenades the only grenades playthrough <laughs> which is interesting especially when you're when you've got like perks to make that easier um that's like when i when i first started streaming fallout 4 and i was doing just punches <laughs> <laughs> that's a fun way to play I yeah. played them all like every style Fallout 3 I even did like a pacifist run where Ooh. I told myself a whole story about how my dad traumatized me and made me kill the rad roach at the beginning <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so uh, disaster piece in chat says the glowing seas lighting is amazing that is that is true as well that one wasn't me that that was the the weather was done by someone else okay so that was that's all weather when you get into that zone that's just all weather lighting yeah interesting so you were mostly like buildings in internal environments yeah and most of the exterior weather was done by Ilya nazaroff who was like one of the concept artists got it that was like bring him in last minute to do weather (laughs) okay cool cool (laughs) you're good with color (laughs) here do some weather stuff thanks um 
cool, cool. So anything else in Fallout 4 that we would we would recognize as being like interesting? I mean, in Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, I've always done corpse art. <laughs> corpse art. Phrase it. Ooh. Yes. Someone's all, got it. All of the yeah, like raider bodies on stakes and oh. other faces that are contorted. I I did all that stuff. Oh, that's great. That stuff's great. Yeah, like um Yeah, that's the best. Super <laughs> like uh, probably all the super mutant yards with all the different like bodies yeah. pinned up against things and hanging off of stuff and yeah. bone bags. Yeah, going and, back to Fallout Three, there's one that I forgot about that's my favorite. It's it's I think even the file might be, might be called this. It's the corpse ducking. Where it's like a corpse and a corpse and a corpse that's also a light. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> it's, it's so that's my sense of humor. I was like, this will be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> this will be hilarious. We'll just put a bunch of corpses inside each other. Hilarious. Oh man, that's funny. Well, I want to get to Fallout seventy six, but first we need to take a break to thank our patrons because they are so amazing. We're actually going to get to a patron chat episode uh probably tomorrow night it looks like at this rate because we're trying to figure out a time that it's going to work for all of them um so we're going to be recording that very soon as well and we're going to figure out our scheduling of whether that episode's going to go up first or this episode will go up first and you know we'll figure it out but we'll be right back after this hello there old chat good to see another of general atomic's finest still eager to serve so this is the part of the show where we get to thank our patrons for being super, super awesome. We have a brand new patron this week. We have a, um, this is a tier four sub, Sergeant Reaper. Perfect name for the season, Sergeant Reaper. Welcome to the Patreon. That means we're up to 50. He was our 50th patron. And that also means that we get to thank our Liberty Prime Mav Eric, Liberty Pie Man. He also goes by Pie Man. Thank you again for maintaining your Liberty Prime sub. And also to our Sentry Bots, Southern Rage and Stagger and Stumble, who get called out every week. Thank you guys for being here. And all of our Assaultrons as well, all of you guys are welcome to join us on the patron episode if you're watching live. And that is either going to be tonight or tomorrow night. Looks like um, the votes currently on the Discord are leaning more on the tomorrow night side. Um, We don't have a hard and fast date for this, but it looks like you guys are going to be more available tomorrow night to talk about the creepy things in Fallout. So um, come join us for that if you can. And if we've done anything to help you get through your work days, your workouts, your commutes to work, or decorating your cat for Halloween, then, you know, check out <laughs> Discord, <laughs> or I'm sorry, patreon.com slash Fallout Lorecast, and also the Discord. You come to the Discord chat with us about Fallout and stuff. Um, but that's what we got going on, and there's a bunch of different rewards you can get on there, including ad-free episodes, episodes early, and of course the ability to join us on future episodes of the show. To talk about all things fallout so go check that out but we've got more to talk to our buddy nate here about and so let's go do that if you have any questions about nuka world i'd be delighted to answer them all right so so and you've you've had a lot to do with lighting right nate that's been mm-hmm. that's kind of your bread and butter and man i love lighting and stuff this is uh, you can see there's i've got all the lighting in here i've got a little bit too much daylight coming through my room like when we're talking real world lighting right you, you do game lighting but i love i love environments i love lighting i love all of this stuff we again talked about some of the stuff in the pre-show um so you walk through my house and and i have colored lighting now in all the rooms because of like hue bulbs and all of that stuff and i've got all these different room modes set up you know like and i can tell alexa like movie time i have to say quiet movie time and then she can like change the lights and, and things i love this stuff and i know in fault 76 one of the big upgrades to the creation engine was improvements in the game lighting and those kinds of things. Um, was that a big difference when you took a look at some of those environments and some of the some of the ways that you could handle some of that stuff for you? Were you able to do some things yeah. you couldn't do before? It was overall, it was way easier to iterate on stuff because the way light bounced around in Fallout 4 was just by hand. So if you had you know light coming through a doorway and then filling up a room, I would just have to copy around lights and then yeah like, oh slightly darker slightly darker slightly darker but then it's always coming from like the wrong direction because it's basically just all these weird floating lights all over right so right. it's super inefficient and takes forever but in 76 it would just bounce automatically so it was much much faster to just like place a light and tune it 
and have that room look correct. And you could always like tune it artistically a little bit after the fact if you wanted to, but you'd get to that starting point where it's not just full of darkness much, much quicker. And then the reflections were also correct instead of being the same random conquered street everywhere <laughs> on every reflection that you look at, like it is in Fallout 4. Right. Yeah. That makes it a lot of sense. Per room. Yeah. Sorry. I've got a barking dog back here. Um, so <laughs> this is what happens when I podcast and nobody else is home. The dog decides he wants to talk to the neighbor dog right in the middle of the show. Um, yeah, I, I was a, I've dabbled a little bit in just like checking out, you know, game engines and playing with lighting and things like that. And just some of the tools that I've been able to play with. And, and I understand what you mean by like being able to place lighting and, and play with it. But that does make a lot more sense. So when you decide to create like a really moody looking room and it automatically builds in the way that reflects and those kinds of things work um what happens if you want to remove the lighting well you can't really because it's always going to bounce like the amount of light based on how bright a surface is but that's how you can adjust it be like well i'm going to point it at a floor that is darker or try and amp up the mood in other ways by placing like fog volumes and stuff because a lot of that is still done by hand so you occlude even though Right. Like when you're out in the wilderness, like the God rays that come through trees, that's kind of automatic, but all the ones in interiors coming from light sources, that's basically just fake geometry where we're like, Oh, this is kind of how it's filling up the area, but it's gotcha. a nice way to add that atmosphere. So that makes sense. Um, so in fallout 76, we're definitely not devoid of creepy environments. Right, <laughs> definitely not. We've got we've got creepy environments. We've got, uh, of course, you've got the forest, which looks nice. You know, you got the forest, and yeah, things are run down, but it's pretty nice. The grass is green. There's trees. There's, you know, there's houses, and some of them aren't too bombed out. You know, it's not not too bad. But then you've got the mire. You've got, I mean, there's, I mean, almost every other zone in Fallout seventy six is creepy in its own way more or less yeah i mean the forest is just to like lull you into that false sense of security yeah yeah you come out of the vault and you're like eh, it's not so bad out here and then you walk for about 15 minutes in any direction other than toward the river which you can't really cross and go very far um <laughs> but any other direction than the river and eventually you go oh this isn't what i thought it was <laughs> this is starting to get, <laughs> get a little bit more dangerous um so we've got all that going on is it, do you have a favorite zone that you, you like to work in the most? Hmm. I think I like the mountains a lot, just because mm -hmm. you get all those cool views, seeing all the other regions and that new system that we added where you see the weather in the other regions. I think that like, really adds to the sense of scale. Yeah. And it's just slightly creepier. Right, and the view distance is beautiful from up there. Speaking about non-creepy things. So that that yeah, part's I mean, actually pretty cool. Really wanted. I mean, it's West Virginia, so there's a lot better topography to work from compared to like Boston. Like that map is fairly flat and pretty uniform compared to 76. So it was a really good opportunity to showcase all of that in that game. Right. Right. Okay. So back back to creepy stuff. Um, do you have? D did you work on the outside locations or just inside locations on this one? I mean, on that one, I did some, some outside locations. Like I did the new River Gorge Bridge and the mm -hmm. giant Green Bank Telescope, ra the radio array, and some uh, like the crashed space station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was mostly, you know, being art director on the game. I mean, right. technically, I was like lead artist, but I was deciding every single asset that we were making, what those regions were, what the different locations were, what all the different monsters were. Yeah. Giving feedback on everything. Yeah. Well, that I definitely want to get. To, I definitely want to get to the monsters, but I, I want to talk uh, areas and things first. So, when it came to like locations and areas, are there any that really stand out to you as like particularly spooky? Some of your favorite spooky, creepy places. I mean, I think the mire is probably the spookiest of them, and mm. I really like like the tree houses that are in there. There's some really cool ones. Yeah. Yeah. I love the tree houses. I love how it feels like. Yeah. Oh. You don't even know how big it is at first on some of those. And they just keep going up. Yeah. And it also kind of feels like, are these going to, should I be climbing in them? Are they going to fall down? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like there's a little bit of like, mm, are, is there, what am I going to find up here? Are there people in them? Are they, are there creatures? Is this going to, is this even able to be walked in? 
you know like what's going what is what is there yeah that that part is particularly creepy and interesting laney do you have any questions i've, I've been doing a lot of talking i want to make sure you get a chance to chime i in. mean you're covering pretty much all the bases <laughs> <laughs> okay if you have anything that pops in your head feel free to jump in um all right so let's go let's move into the creepers cre- creepers let's just call them all creepers because fallout 76 has lots of cryptids lots of creepy mutated weird things um heck even the squirrels even the squirrels in fallout 76 are creepy looking like there's scorched squirrels running around in the in the game so okay let's let's just go through your list of like favorite things to work on favorite creepy things to work on and create where where do you start i mean just all the monsters and coming up with that list was great because i would dug through all the lore of the region and stuff. And a lot of that stuff is not as searchable, but like everybody knows the Mothman, but right. if you go and look up Grafted Monster and stuff like that's not really out there quite so much. So I was reading actual, you know, books. Hey, yeah, those exist still. Yeah. And so the Grafted Monster, the, lore. the Grafted Monster, that was Looney Tunes inspired, right? Like, yeah, no. I don't think so. No, no, like the big, the, no. the big monster. We know where that came from. No, you no, no, goop. not the name, not the name, the Grafton monster. But you know, you know, in Looney Tunes, where um, Marvin the Martian has to deal with the big, the big guy with the shoulders with like no neck. That never crossed my mind, but now that you say it, I can see with the connection. You know what I'm talking about? That, that, Maybe that that's, guy. See, that's that explains where the whole story came from because I was reading that story and I was like, this thing is bonkers we got to put this in like who came up with this <laughs> yeah well I mean, yeah not the lore of it but like the the character so design Tunes. like the, the way the character looks he looks like the big guy from the looney Tunes, except that he you know obviously doesn't have a face um <laughs> in fallout he always looks like that guy to me anyway okay so the grafton monster <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, I mean, he's such an interesting design. He's just like this big thing, and he doesn't even have a head. Like, where did the head That's go? Why so angry. That's why he's so angry. So angry. Yeah. Like, uh, how do you even come up with a design like that? Like, most creatures have heads. But you're just like, well, let's come up with a design for a new character. Why don't we just not have a head? Soul. Yeah, it was all based on the stories because they talked about this giant hulking beast with no head dripping oil so it's like that uh, that's sounds amazing. like something that we could definitely do and you know, there's all these ways to spin it in the lore for the real game for mm-hmm. you know obviously it's not the real cryptid but it's like fev can do a lot of different things that you might not necessarily get from just oh it's a chicken but radiated like right. that only goes so far right right yeah oh man that guy that guy's great i would love i want more of those also i would really to have love to have like a mini one <laughs> I know I know you don't work there anymore, but if anybody's listening, I want like mini Grafton monsters, like little chicken sized ones, like running around, just like <laughs> just like little guys. Um okay, so what other what other ones stand out to you as like some of your favorite designs? I love the design of the Snallygaster with Yo, all the eyeballs. Oh, it's so gross. And the way it runs, it's awesome. Oh yeah, man. The extra arms. Mm-hmm. Oh, the Pretty eyeballs! Nasty. The extra. I mean, you realize for the first, like, when you first see it off in the distance, you're like, "Oh, what is that?" Because the shape is just weird. And then it starts spitting at you, and you're like, "Okay, okay gross." And then you kill it, and you walk up, and the eyes are just like still looking around, <laughs> and then they're like on its back and stuff, and you're like, "Oh, oh, oh." <laughs> Yeah, that's one we tried to make as gross as possible, almost. Yeah, I think, I think you did a good job <laughs> with that one. That one was pretty solid. Um, also, the frogs with the eggs in the back. Like, anybody... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah that's that was designed to, like, trigger people with, what is it, tryptophobia? Yeah, that, yeah. One, that one definitely works for triggering that. I've got a little bit of that. Definitely works. Um, <laughs> uh, the bee? The freaking bee thing with the hive? Oh, the- Honey yeah. Oh, the honey beast. Oh, that one's that one's kind of got that going on as well. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that one's pretty good. Um, the other one, one of the other ones that people mentioned was the uh, the gulper as being particularly kind of gross and just kind of like a big lizard looking thing that's kind of wet with a big old mouth, kind of. You know, and it's not as out there as like the Grafton monster, but definitely kind of just like come across it and you're just like, oh, nope, I'm noping out of that. Yeah. 
I mean, I think that one got added in on the DLC for four, and that obviously is basically you know point lookout version two. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. a lot of opportunity to add more creepy monsters in that. Yeah, those like they show up and you're just like, oh, okay, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little bit like Alien, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, um, what else is there? Oh, oh, the um, uh, the uh, sheep squatch. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about the sheep squatch? I love the sheep squatch. Convincing Todd to do that was uh, amusing. I would say he was <laughs> like, "It's called what now? Are you, <laughs> that's real." <laughs> that's, a, that's how the conversation went oh yeah at first he like totally didn't believe me i think he thought i was just messing with him like no i'm serious <laughs> serious this is a real thing this is people this is, this is real here let me yeah, show you put these cryptids on the map todd <laughs> <laughs> you want to you want to do what with the game out of what what a what squash <laughs> <laughs> next thing you're gonna do a pig squash <laughs> that's a great idea that's yeah, terrifying. A pig squatch? Well, a pig squatch? That's actually, like, maybe too scary. <laughs> Can you imagine the squealing? Can you imagine? The squealing coming from it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, I just watched a really old movie, actually, uh, Razorback. It's like about a giant hog in Australia. Not a great movie, but it is basically that. It's basically a pig squatch. Yeah, pigs yeah. can get pretty creepy in horror. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you get all the nasty tusks. And- oh, mm-hmm. and they're also similar enough to people that you kind of get the, you know, like yeah. the fleshy thing going with skin. Well, and they're kind of like sentient, sentient. They like, they're real smart yeah. too, and like yeah. people in that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, I could see that being a problem. Um, okay, so so final final 76 question here. Are, is there anything that you left on like the drawing board that you were like really hoping to get into the game? Any ideas that you were like, this would have been really cool, but you just didn't, weren't able to get it in the game or, or just like thoughts that you were like, Oh, I wish we could have made this work. that just didn't make it. So one of the locations that I added was the deep in the wastelanders expansion, mm-hmm. which was just sort of my personal side project at first that, people ended up liking enough that it became part of like the actual main quest and all that. But one thing that I wanted to do with it was it has that big giant cave at the end. And I wanted to have a massive creature sort of embedded in the wall. Oh. That you just see like an eyeball, but I ended up running out of time and not being able to do that. But instead we got the little baby one in that one cave. Uh-huh. So I, I put that one in instead. Oh man, that would have been so cool, and everybody would yeah, have been like, awesome. "Oh, ancient gods, Cthulhu, <laughs> yeah, there's something underground. What is it?" Yeah, that would have been great. Yeah, I hope, I hope the whole time. I hope, I, yeah, I hope we get more of that kind of stuff. What is this thing underneath the ground? Giant monster. Oh, that would be so good. Yeah, you just have to shoot it in the eye enough to for, for the eye to eventually poke out. Like, what does it do? <laughs> Like, I feel like that would just make it mad, and then it would, you know, come forth. Right, and like just all of Appalachia is now on the back of a giant mountain monster. Yeah. Like, like Seneca Rocks is a ridge on its back. And yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, and now it's just walking around the That's United cool. States as a, just a giant monster. <laughs> that would be amazing. Now, now it's just yeah, a completely so- different game at this <laughs> at that point. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually the. The creature that's at the bottom of the lucky hole mine, that that file is called like the gut puker. That was one of the initial pitches for what could be like scorch beasts and stuff. Like oh. what could be this big boss? And we we ended up, you know, obviously it never became a real creature, but I liked it so much that I made that sculpt and put it down in the bottom of that dungeon uh-huh. as sort of a little Easter egg for that because I like the design a lot. There's a really cool concept of them walking around in the cranberry bog, and you see those towering silhouettes off in the distance yeah yeah man that stuff that stuff is really cool too i hope we do get more of that stuff um i know we can't ask you about anything having to do with starfield because that stuff's just not out there yet but it'll be exciting to see and talk about some of that stuff maybe in the future once the game launches and we can get a little bit more you know info on what's out there and and see some of that stuff 
Um, I'm sure you've had some sort of influence on what's in that game as well because you've you worked on it. Um, but yeah, worked on it for about a year. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I I know you're working on this other project, which you've is, has something to do with. It sounds awesome. Some open world <laughs> heavy metal it thing. Sounds really cool. Um, is there anything yeah. you want to share with us about that? Well, it is a open world heavy metal horror hunting game. So okay, it's all so about perfect creatures. <laughs> so I've teased the creatures a little bit. Like I put out a little photo here, like a while back, of just parts of one. But I'm spending a lot of time making different creatures. Nice. Okay. So this That's is so, so cool. this is like breaking news. <laughs> this is breaking news. So open world heavy metal horror and now hunting. Mm -hmm. holy 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 moly working my way towards actually unveiling the thing but i did want to start talking a little bit more to so people had an idea of what it is Mm -hmm. man this sounds like right up my alley this sounds awesome yeah no just looking at your twitter i'm like (laughs) whoo so okay so you're 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 hunting so you're okay so you're equipping yourself with like different weapons I mean, I'm assuming it's it's open world. So you're you're like finding or equipping weapons. You're tracking down monsters. Yeah, I would say it's more on like the simulation side of things because I got the inspiration of playing. Like, if you've ever played a Hunter or Call of the Wild and stuff like that. Yeah. Where you're following tracks and stuff, but I play those games and I'm just like, but well, what if it was monsters? Right. What instead <laughs> of a deer? Immediately where, where my brain goes because right. you hear noises at, at night in that game and stuff. Like, what's that noise? Yeah obviously it's a monster in it's, it's never a monster in that game and it's I'm a so freaking deer and then you scare game. it and it runs off into the woods and you're like ah i was another 15 minutes <laughs> wasted trying to get this freaking deer but instead it's a monster and it wants to eat your head yes yes that sounds freaking amazing um man i have so many questions but i i don't know what i can and can't ask um <laughs> okay so is there like lore to these monsters yeah, there's definitely lore and a world behind it and all that. So cool. I'll probably be cool. unveiling that over time. Okay. Okay, man, this is exciting. But it does have that heavy metal soundtrack to it all also. Mm-hmm. Is this like which, a, a originally, is this a solo player, a single player kind of experience? Yeah, it will be a single player game. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's I have a composer, but besides that, it's just me. So I think doing a multiplayer game by myself would be pretty difficult it's multiplayer okay. games you know i've been yeah. through that that is orders of magnitude more complexity yeah i believe it i believe it man um so you've got you've got the composer you and who is who is the composer because you announced this recently on on twitter yeah the composer is clifford meyer who was in the bands like isis and red sparrows which were really big post-metal bands at the time mm-hmm. and isis was always like one of my favorite bands and I would work to them constantly. And I just kind of emailed him out of the blue one day. I was like, Hey, do you guys license music? And then he was like, Hey, yeah, we do. But are you looking for anyone to make any music? I was like, what? Nice. Yes. Nice thing ever. So you got to get a band or a person from a band that you really looked up to and worked to their music for forever to work on this thing with you. That's nuts. Yeah. I feel incredibly lucky about it. And he's been great to work with. Like just like, super open to it and really into the idea he's been knocking it out of the park that's phenomenal that's phenomenal so okay so open world you're hunting these monsters through the environment you're tracking them i bet they i'm I'm just kind of riffing in my brain here they probably each move differently you have to track them each differently they respond differently to stimuli um Mm -hmm. you have to fight them differently (laughs) right like they're different kinds of monsters you uh they're both they're dangerous in different ways you probably have different weapons and things what kind of art style are you going for with this is this something you can talk about yet yeah i can talk about that a little bit like um so i'm using unreal engine 5 so Mm -hmm. one of the big things that that lets you do is this thing called nanite which is basically incredibly detailed models so there's lots and lots of detail but on the other hand i want it to be easier to play and to actually track things and stuff. Cause if you actually try and track things in real life, it turns out, you know, that's incredibly difficult. So <laughs> yeah, it's sort yeah. of this blend of highly realistic models with a lot of detail, but stylized a little bit and like cleaner okay. with like the surface detail. So you can actually see what those tracks are and they stand out a lot more and you can see what the lighting is doing really cleanly. 
Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like if you ever go into a game and turn off all the textures, what that looks like, but right. with a little bit more like color information than that. Okay. Because okay. I've always liked the way that looks. So just like you can really see what the lighting is doing. You can see all the work that people put into models that mm-hmm. can kind of get lost in the end when you put too much noise on stuff. Right. Right. Okay. So it's like, so it's, it's, it's real world inspired, but then stylized. Yeah. Which also came out of playtesting the whole thing. It's just like, oh, it's too hard to track. What can I do that gives it a unique look, but also makes the game better? Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't want it to be a, a UI heavy game. Like generally it's all going to be in world stuff, actually. Oh, like whenever you upgrade and stuff, you'll be activating things in the world. And- Nice. All that stuff is like menus on your weapons, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dude, this sounds and awesome. I just like that feel of like being really in a game, and I don't like games that really take you out. And it's like follow the line and go to the glowy thing. And, right. Instead, you have to be paying attention to the environment design. you're in. Right. Like looking right. between the trees, not looking at the notification in front of the trees or past the trees. Yeah, yeah. staring at the mini map in the corner. <laughs> right, right. I'm no, playing yeah. the mini map game. Go, go look at the at the landmarks and like pay attention maybe and pull out a map and be like, "Oh, I see that thing there. That's the way I should head." Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's respect cool. the player. Right. And I get that that's not for everyone and some people don't want that stuff, but I think there's a lot of other players who are like, mm-hmm. "No, I really want the game where I'm supposed to pay attention." Right. Well, it's the, it's the Dark Souls amazing. philosophy, right? It's the, yes. it's the, you know, make it hard so that when you actually accomplish it, you feel like you accomplished something. Yeah. And I think I've been starting you. out. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go I've ahead. been starting out playing all, all games I play for the first time now on the hardest difficulty oh, wow. <laughs> for every game so that I can just get in there and get good, you know, and now I can, <laughs> now I can play them and enjoy, enjoy everything for what it is, you know, but I, I want it to kick my ass right in the beginning. You know, and it, it that started because I played Dark Souls last year for the first time. <laughs> and so, like, I totally understand wanting to just, like, let the game come at you, immerse yourself, like, all of that, for sure. I, I really like Dark Souls, but I feel like a lot of games that get hard miss the point on how that game teaches you and why it works mm-hmm. as a hard game mm-hmm. in the way that it's almost not actually that hard in a way because you like always get better in that game unless you mess up mm-hmm. but you are leveling slowly so it's kind of tricking you a little bit that it's not maybe quite as hardcore as other games that are hard and right. you lose yeah. and then you're just screwed and start over from the beginning right right no the game yeah. the game does a very good job in fact the game it's you yourself are the greatest enemy in dark souls because mm-hmm. it's it's your wanting to just hurry through it that you have to fight against if you are patient yeah. once you and, get sloppy right it's your patience that is the greatest asset in that game if you patiently just take on everything and look around every corner then you're you're going to be fine it's mm-hmm. it's when you're impatient that you lose um but yeah so but this sounds like the same kind of thing like if you're patiently paying attention to everything you're using everything that you learn it sounds like you're going to do pretty well but if you start stop paying attention to the signs and you stop paying attention to the things that you're learning as you're tracking these monsters, then you might lose track of them or they might get, you know, come at you from an angle you weren't expecting. And then all of a sudden now you're monster chow. I'm definitely doubling down on that angle. Like I've even simulated your heart rate in the game. Mm -hmm. So if you like run really fast, like your senses will change, like certain sounds will drop out and like you're not going to be hearing the rustling in the, the woods over there if you're sprinting through the woods you know you know here and then you gotta take a breath and then what's that noise right oh man right right do you have like other That's little critters good. and things that like pull your attention in the wrong direction like ah oh, crap it was a squirrel <laughs> we'll see how much time i have <laughs> how much stuff i can jam in like oh it's just a squirrel oh it was a it was a you know fox over there instead of the monster you know those, those kinds of things like <laughs> That would be cool. Um, man, this is a lot of fun, fun stuff. Um, anything else you want to share before we head out? I think that that probably covers it for now. Awesome. Hoping to sh- show more soon. Okay. Do you have a, um, like a prospective release date or is this more of a, just like a, when you get there, you're done and then, and then you're going to, you know, launch it. I do have a whole schedule and stuff, but I'll probably announce that shortly after I announce the whole thing for real. Okay. Cool, cool. Well, we'll stay tuned. And is there what's the best way for people to keep track of this and your progress and and you and everything you're doing? Well, 
can follow me on Twitter at and Perky Pile or go to justperkygames.com. Awesome. Awesome. And you have a, you can sign up on your website, correct? To get like uh, notifications, yeah. like email, uh, email notifications every time yeah, I have like update. a newsletter and that also has all the links to everything else like Instagram or whatever. Yeah. Go sign up for the newsletter. I'm, I'm on the newsletter and cause I know I want to be notified every time there's a new update. And, and anything going on with your project. So um, go do that. Thanks again for joining us. This has been um, very, very informative when it comes to the background of Fallout and all the stuff that you've worked on. It's always cool to get some behind the scenes stuff, especially you know as fans of the games and gamers. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we don't get to see because we're not the people with the tools that make the stuff. We're the people behind the designs. We're just the people who get to enjoy it. So thank you for being here and taking the time to do this. Also, best of luck with your new project. It sounds like it's, it's coming along and it's gonna be awesome. I can't wait to give it a try. And um, just, you know, thanks for taking the time, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Lainey, you have anything else you want to share before we head out? You going to do any oh. streaming coming up? Um, No. <laughs> well, I might move you on, on yours if you want to play some Back for Blood. Yeah, um, every morning. Which has been very fun so far. And definitely not one that you can start on the hardest setting of because that game destroys no. you yes <laughs> yes yeah you gotta yeah. unlock some cards you gotta learn the levels you gotta you gotta work yeah. your way up it's really good <laughs> absolutely um but yeah i've been streaming in the morning so come join me i mentioned this last week come join me on uh the stream twitch.tv slash robots radio every morning uh i went all the way to um from 8 30 to 12 30 today and we've been having a great time with the community you guys have been awesome having a lot of fun and that's what I've been doing. So you guys know you guys know where everything is, robustradio.net, for all the different shows and everything that we've got going on. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for being here, chat. And we'll be back. I'll be back tomorrow morning. And we'll be back next week with our regular episode and probably either tonight or tomorrow night with our patron chat. So lots of fun Fallout Lorecast stuff going on lately. So stay tuned for that. All right, everybody. We'll see you later. Have a good one. Plug into everything else we're doing. Check out robotsradio.net. Also, look up the Robots Radio YouTube for videos about Fallout and other things. And check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash robotsradio. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.